All right, Ephesians 6, look at verse 23 again. He says, Peace be to the brethren and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, all right, here's my question, Rita. Where does your faith come from? So what are you telling me? <laughs> Where does your faith come from? Okay. Y'all turn back with me to Ephesians chapter 2. Well, notice first of all there in Ephesians 6, 23. It says, love with faith from... God the Father and Lord Jesus Christ. Come back to Ephesians chapter 2. Look at verse 8. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Alright, I got a question. In verse 8, where it says, and that, not of yourselves. What does the that refer to? Hmm? Okay. What is the gift of God? The faith? Or the grace? Or the both? <laughs> and this, this gets thick, doesn't it? Yeah. I know why you're having the reaction you're having because of the theological background. Well, well, we're going to get into that. Yeah, go ahead. One of the things this week, I, uh, I got someone, I, I coached David Reeves. Mm-hmm. Like I mentioned that. David had talked about faith, and I actually, I have to admit, I don't want everything that I post mm-hmm. because I trust it. But I had a comment, well, faith. Mm-hmm. You know, and thing. It's interesting. You said a phrase in there very quickly. You trust in what the Lord puts in front of you. That that requires the Lord putting it in front of you, right? All right. So let me be a strict grammarian for a second. Generally, what you do when you... Verse 8 there, where you come to the word that, you look for what they call the closest antecedent to determine what it's speaking about. And the closest antecedent is the faith. So if I'm reading that correctly, then what I see there is that the faith comes from God. I couple that with Ephesians chapter 6, verse 23, and it says, Love with faith... From God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And the question I ask is, where does your faith come from? Okay? Now, if I'm just looking at those two verses right now, I'm going to say, your faith comes from God the Father. This is where the debate starts. <laughs> okay? And it is an extreme debate. And so I'm going to, I'm going to just kind of like, I feel like this is like a bag and it's got a tie around it, and it's like it's bulging. And, and I'm just going to come, and I'm going to clip the little tie. It's going to boom, and it's going to blow up, and everybody's going to see all this confetti pour out of it and go, oh, that's the debate, okay? Now, when we say your faith comes from God, you've got to be careful because some people hear that and they go, wait, but some people don't have faith in God. So does that mean God didn't give them faith? All right, so this is the debate. This is the debate. Okay? All right. Um, before y'all start accusing me of being a Calvinist. Okay? <laughs> yeah, look at Truman's Trim, like, too late! <laughs> yeah, I'm stepping in some territory here. I'm stepping off in some stake. All right. Before you accuse me of being a Calvinist, I need to tell you what I do not mean when I say your faith comes from God. Okay? I do not mean what John Calvin taught. John Calvin, let me pause here, because I know some of y'all may not be familiar with this. John Calvin, in history, was a theologian. 
He was a biblical scholar. Okay? It was his life mission to study the Bible. I'm putting this as in basic, simple terms as I can. As a result of his study, he developed a theology, a, a um, what's the best, a really a philosophy of Scripture that still today is prevalent in Christianity. It is in Baptist churches. It is in Presbyterian churches. I've even seen it in some forms crop up in Catholic churches. I mean, it's, it's everywhere. It's, it, is, it is ubiquitous. It is everywhere. It's, 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 uh, it's in a multitude of places. Okay, so, what did John Calvin teach? Let me just kind of, this is again, and some of y'all, this, you've done this before, or you know this, or you've read this, studied this. I'm going to give it to you in the simplest terms I know how to. Okay. And, and the way people explain this is with an acronym. Okay. And the acronym is TULIP. Okay. You'll hear this talked about all the time. TULIP. T-U-L-I-P. These five points in basic form describe Calvin's system of theology. They are the five tenets, basic tenets of his whole view of Scripture. Y'all with me? Does that make sense so far? They are, <clears throat> they sort of build on one another. Okay? Now, you'll hear people say this all the time, are you five points? Or you'll hear this in, in biblical circles. You may not hear this at the co-op reader. I'm just going to be honest with you. Okay, probably not going to hear that. I'm like, hey, guys coming to get feed. You know what I mean? Um, you'll hear some Baptist preacher talk about, well, I'm about four and a half points. Okay? You're going, you're, you'll hear all, kind, hear all kinds of variation on this. What does it stand for? T, so the first tenet of John Calvin's system of theology is what we call total depravity. Now, that's a why. Here's the thing you need to do as a Bible student anytime you start seeing and hearing this stuff. Do not take it at face value. You need to do just like the Bereans did in Acts chapter 17 and go to the Word of God, study the Word of God rightly divided to see if these things are so. If they ain't, don't take it. Okay? Now, John Calvin's notion of total depravity goes something like this. You as a human are broken. Agree? Is that what the Bible teaches? Are y'all sure? <laughs> y'all start out doing this and you went... <laughs> I've got y'all so... I know, I've got such a sway on y'all. That is true. Okay, we are in Adam and Adam, was, you know, he fell. Okay, but this is where John Calvin extends that. When John Calvin talks about total depravity, it's not just that humans are fallen, it's that you are so totally fallen to the point you are incapacitated. You do not have the capacity to have faith in God. You are incapable. You are totally depraved. He's saying this about just the natural born person. Okay? This a person in their lost state is totally depraved. Okay? This is the this is the first premise of his whole system. Now let me ask you, does the Bible teach that you are so totally fallen that you cannot have faith in God? It's okay to say no. <laughs> okay. It doesn't. Okay, so now, the rest of this, you might as well forget it. Who cares? Because the first premise upon which the rest of these are stacked upon has fallen. For what it's worth, I'm a zero points Calvinist. Okay? I'm a zero points Calvinist. I'm not even a shade of it. I can't be because the, the first premise I don't even agree with. Okay, now, so here's where John Calvin goes from here. He says, okay... Since humanity is so totally depraved, they're incapacitated, then we get this next thing called unconditional election. Okay? Unconditional election means this. God has to intervene. 
And He can't intervene based on your works because none of your works are good. You are so totally depraved. There's nothing redeemable. You're terrible. So he has, to, he has to intervene, and it has to be unconditioned, okay? Meaning that he's going to choose you based on his own sovereignty, not on anything you do. He is going to elect you based on his thoughts, okay? He has to give you the faith because you don't have it in and of yourself. You with me? So the next point, let me ask you this. Is everybody saved? So what does that mean if I believe his system of theology? Ah, he only chooses some. Now there's this term in Calvinistic theology called double predestination. And the term double predestination means that if God chooses those whom He's going to save, save, it also means by default He's choosing those whom He's going to condemn to an eternity in hell. The problem with that is you don't see that in the Bible. <laughs> okay? It ain't there. <laughs> okay? So anyway, you get total depravity, which then unleashes unconditional election, God choosing those whom He's going to save, which is the next point. Limited atonement. The atoning work of Christ is limited to those whom God elects unconditionally who are totally depraved. I, I guess some are prettier than others. I don't know what he, what it, I don't know what you know. I don't know what it is, but nonetheless. So, limited atonement. He only died for a few. Do you see that in the Bible? You know, this is the famous verse that everyone likes to quote. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, right? I mean, it's kind of hard to, to really build this argument. I, I'll just be honest. For me personally, I understand why people go down. Now, here's what I will say for John Calvin and his system. It is logical. It makes sense. It is rational. It's just like a math problem. One plus one equals two. It, happens, it works every time. I mean, so it is logical in that sense, but the logic is faulty based on the fact that the Word of God doesn't say this. And so it's not always the best policy just to go with logic. You need to look and see what the Word of God says. Okay, now, limited atonement. He only dies for those he's going he's gonna to elect. So then it leads to the next point. Irresistible. I think I spelled it right. Irresistible grace. Okay? Now, for those few that God has uh, sent His Son to die for, that He has unconditionally elected, who are totally depraved, when He arms them, if you will, with their faith, they will see His grace. And because He has unconditionally elected them, they will not be able to resist His offer. Therefore, they will exercise that faith. It is irresistible in that sense. There's nothing they're going to do in their life that's going to help them break free from that attraction to the grace. <laughs> Rick is giving me that look like, would you say... Yeah, I know. Why not just, you know, get you some angels that do just what you want? Some robots. So here again, this is where in history the whole debate, you know, and this is one pendulum swing. Then we get to another pendulum swing. You get Joseph Arminius and you get Arminianism, which is where we get things like free will Baptist, that you have complete choice, choice not only to choose Jesus, but choice to get out of it too. So you get these pendulum swings. Then you get just a Campbell, a Campbellite tradition. You, know, you get all shades. Now, once you once once irresistible grace is like the tractor beam pull is on you and it's pulling at you and you give in. Once you give in, then you get the last point, which is called perseverance of the saints. Okay. Now, in John Calvin's 
system here. Obviously, once you have been elected, you've given in to the irresistible grace and all this stuff, because you didn't get it by your own doing anyway, it ain't going to let go of you. So you will persevere to the end no matter what. Persevering meaning not that you're going to be perfect and good, but that there is nothing that can undo your salvation. Okay? And so that's his system. Now here's the reason why I bring this up. Because there are those that will read Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. Look at it again. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. If I tell you that your faith is from God, some people read into it Calvinistic theology that says, yeah, it's not your faith. God had to give it to you because you were so totally depraved. He had to unconditionally elect you because He died for you and you can't resist it. And they'll start reading into that verse that philosophy. Okay? The problem is, is they can't go to the other portions of Scripture anywhere front to back and substantiate this unless... Well, they can if they're not rightly dividing. So I'll give you a perfect example of this, at least on the surface. If you go back to the Old Testament and you see round about uh, Genesis chapter 12 where God comes to Abraham and He says, I'm going to make you the father of many nations. What did Abraham do to deserve that? What happened? God chose him. You know what God did? He elected Abraham. You know what He did for Israel? He elected Israel. But see, here's what happens. When people don't rightly divide and see the distinction between Israel and the church, the body of Christ, they then say, well, if He elected Israel and we're now Israel, then He elected us. Y'all see the problem? Do you see now the necessity of rightly dividing and keeping things separate that the Word of God keeps separate? Otherwise, you get this mixed and mingled theology. And unfortunately, I believe that's what John Calvin did. He mixed and mingled it to the point that it has so taken hold and so taken root in American Christianity especially that now you can't argue people off this mountain. I mean, they will fight to the death on it. Boy, let me tell you, and you're just a complete idiot if you don't believe it. <laughs> How could he miss the phrase, or the, the, the phrase the name of Christ when it speaks about it? Yeah, how, how could he miss Romans 11? How could he miss Jeremiah 31? I mean, honestly, and, I, and I'm not saying that at you, but the same way that you're asking me. It's like, but you and I, and, and this is where we talk about the recovery of truth, if you will, or the, the, the um, not the recovery, but the, the rediscovery. Um, it, it's just amazing to me. i tell you what can happen, too. A lot of times when you're so trained on a system of thought, you do. We as humans, we get these blinders, and we can only see it that way. You know, and it takes somebody come along to punch that and shatter that notion, and then like, whoa, what just happened? You know, <laughs> sound familiar, doesn't it, Truman? <laughs> and so, so here's the thing: that's I do when I say your faith comes from God. I do not mean this. So, okay, I do not mean that. Let me show you what I do mean. All right, Ray, you got something to say? We get thick in the weeds there for a minute. <laughs> Renee's sitting there going, I don't even know what happened. I don't even know what just happened. Just, <laughs> she gave up. She said, I'm, I'm done. It says, for my grace. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I liked it. I like your thinking there. Now, you actually said it right off the bat earlier. I just didn't want to give you credence yet because I don't want you to think you're too smart. Um, go with me to Romans chapter 10. <laughs> Romans chapter 10, verse 17. Rita, you actually know what this verse says. You probably just didn't know that was the reference. Romans 10, 17. Let me, let me tell you what we do mean when we say your faith is from God. Romans 10, 17. What does it say, Rita? 
Alright, so, here's the thing. Um, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. So, the way in which God gives everyone, now listen carefully here, with the opportunity for faith. Okay? The way He gives everyone with the opportunity for faith is by His Word. It is by His Word. Understand this. Faith is never blind. It is never ignorant. You didn't just up one day go, I heard this name Jesus. Yeah, I'll believe it. Without knowing something about it. And, and that's coming back to what you were saying, Norm, earlier. And you, you made that statement in passing. There has to be an object of your faith. Something that excites your faith, I should even say. Um, something to sort of um, elicit it, if you will. But it, it's always trusting in something. It always has that object. Now, God gives everyone opportunity for faith because He has given everyone grace. This is where you got to. This right here is just such a crazy statement. When Jesus died, now we know who is He dying for. That grace was unlimited. It was open to any and all. We know that now, okay? Any and all. So, any and all have opportunity now to trust it, right? Because that was for everyone. Now, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. You and I today, how do we know about that grace? Through the Word, okay? Okay? And that has appeared to everybody. Now go with me to Titus chapter 2. Take a right turn. Go over to Titus. Titus chapter 2. Look at verse 11. Has God limited those to whom He wants His grace to be effective for? What's the verse say? As to all, you got it, Renee. See, you caught back up. Renee checked out on this garbage, and she just checked back in. She's like, "I got it. Good job." That's right. What does the verse say? It says, "For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men." Do all men accept it? But do all men have the opportunity? See, that takes a little faith, doesn't it? Because everybody wants to go, what about the you know, naked people running around down there in the Amazon jungle? Okay, well, according to that, the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. You know, I don't know how that's happened. Yeah. Yeah. They're probably at an advantage these days, too. They're away from all this garbage that's going on in the world. Now, turn back with me to John, the Gospel of John, chapter 1. Okay, John chapter 1, let's read verse 1. In the beginning was the what? Word. And the Word was with... Notice it's capitalized. Who is it talking about? Talking about Jesus. Okay. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. So it's talking about Jesus, right? This, this Word, the light. Now, that light, look what it says about Him in verse 9. That was the true light which lighteth what? 
Every man that cometh into the world. Women, sorry, you're excluded. It says men. <laughs> Renee didn't like that part. She checked out. She's like, no, I don't agree. Uh, mankind. So every person that's come into the world, okay, um, has been lighted. It has appeared. It has been shown, manifested, whatever the word you want to use there, okay? It is not limited. It is unlimited, okay? Everybody, so let me say it like this. Everybody's got opportunity for faith, okay? So, coming back full circle, when I say that faith comes from God, ultimately, okay, as He provides opportunity to everyone, they have the opportunity for faith, Okay? That's where your faith comes from. That's where it's rooted. It has to have that object. And without that, it doesn't exist. Okay? And so, um, that's why I say faith comes from God. So come back to Ephesians 6. Come back to Ephesians 6, verse 23. Again, Paul, in his parting words here, these well wishes, these kind words, these things that he desires for them, these last remarks, he says, Peace be to the brethren. And love with faith. Faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me tell you, there is nothing more powerful than a faith that is rooted and grounded in the truth of God's Word. That is coupled with love. And as it speaks and goes forward... How powerful it can be. I mean, there's no match to it. It is incredibly powerful. Um, And so, think about this now. Paul wishes for their love to be accompanied with their faith. Um, And if we want our faith to grow, if we know it comes from the Word of God, okay, how do we get our faith to grow? Get back in that Word and continue to grow. And that's what we need to do so that our faith will expand. That's why Paul, if you get back into the early part of Ephesians chapter 1, he prays that they would grow in knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and of God's will and all these things and to understand the depth of His love because it's effective, it's powerful, it's timeless. Okay? That was a sip from a fire hydrant right there for a little bit. But y'all handled it well. Gene didn't go to sleep. And I'm finished now, Gene, so you didn't get your nap in. But you get to go home early, 25 minutes early. Uh, (laughs) Hey, that is going to be a busy place today. I'm just going to tell you. (laughs) Hey, you know, honestly... Um, y'all may not really get into the finer points of this stuff in your conversations and stuff. Preachers tend to. We tend to fight and debate over this kind of stuff. Um, ultimately, the reason why I bring this up is be careful that you don't just take something at face value. Because it, it can kind of sound right at first, like totally depraved. Yeah, we're depraved. You know? Um, this idea of perseverance of the saints, we believe in once saved, always saved, Right? Um, but on completely different terms than this is built upon, you know. And so you got to be careful that you don't just take things at face value. You kind of really have to lean into it and study, study. Let your faith grow.